So you've all been sending me lots of burning questions about HCMC versus Philip Morris, so I figured it's time to answer some of them. I'll do this once in a while, so keep sending me your stock lock questions and I'll get to as many as I can. You can also jump into our Discord server to chat with me in real time, and I put a link to that Discord in the description below. Now let's get to your questions. First questions came from OTC Loser and Saint Photo. Those are, they're asking about the stats on motion to dismiss related to patent cases, and also some of the potential things that can happen, the likelihood of maybe losing the motion to dismiss. So first of all, one third of patent cases generally involve a motion to dismiss, and about one third of those motions get granted, and granted means that the cases are tossed out. So one third of one third of all cases. But the reason they can get thrown out is for a lot of different reasons, not just the reason that we're dealing with here in the case. For example, you might have what's called a standing issue. Standing is when the party that brings the lawsuit, you actually have to have ownership rights to the patent or have to be related to the patent in some way. So if you bring a lawsuit and you don't actually own the rights to the patent, then you're not going to have standing to sue. So often, a motion to dismiss gets granted because the party didn't have standing with that patent. For example, if you check out Max Sound versus Google uh, in California, I made a video about it a few weeks ago, that was an example where the company Max Sound didn't actually own the rights to the patent that they were suing upon, uh, and so the, they lost a motion to dismiss. It was granted against them because they didn't have the standing. Another thing that could happen is with what's called patent eligibility. Uh, the court will go through a process and look at the patent to decide if it even applies to the case. And if it turns out that there's not even a valid patent that applies to the case, well, that case is going to get thrown out on a motion to dismiss as well. There's also different ca cases and situations where the type of patent matters in the motion to dismiss um, conflict. So, for example, the Supreme Court has ruled that there's some extra guidelines. And it's extra hard to get a patent case through on computer software because of all the different things that can happen with computer software. So there are higher standards for some patents than others that may make motion to dismiss be granted more often than not. So in this case, it's all about the factual allegations that are being alleged by HCMC and whether they're sufficient enough. So we have this huge fight over the combustion definition, the combustion issue. And I think if the judge just takes the complaint for what it says, the motion's an easy denial. But here's that other issue I mentioned at the end of the last video. In the last 10 years or so, there's been an increase in the number of judges who are willing to look at a motion to dismiss as a preview of what the parties will argue at trial, and then decide the case then and there. However, there's another motion that usually comes way later in the process called a motion for summary judgment. That's the motion that's supposed to be where the judge looks at all the arguments and the evidence that the parties brought to the table throughout the process, and then decide whether there's enough to rule on the case without wasting time at trial. A motion for summary judgment is basically a mini version of the trial with just a judge, and it tends to come much later in the lawsuit process. But what's been happening recently is that judges are starting to use motions to dismiss as pseudo-early motions for summary judgment. Now, the majority of lawyers and judges believe that's a bad approach to law and shouldn't be happening. Now, with summary judgment motions, if there's a key fact that isn't clear, basically if the parties disagree about something that's really important that underlines the whole case, then the case will continue. So if the judge takes Philip Morris's motion to dismiss and treats it like a motion for summary judgment, well, I think he has to deny the motion anyway because there's a really huge important fact at issue here, which is what the next question talks about. And here we have a question from Lacey Ford about what about this pr partial combustion issue? What about how the IQOS reaches the attempts that would cause partial combustion? Well, that's the whole core of the case. What is combustion and what is partial combustion compared to that definition? Is reaching temperatures that could cause combustion enough to be a device that combusts? Well, that's a great question for the court or even a jury to answer through the legal process. Philip Morris says it's just ignition and burning, and it takes a higher temperature to combust than what the IQ OS is designed to do. But HCMC says that combustion is possible in the IQ OS based on the temperatures at which combustion starts. So we've got a dispute in what combustion means for how we should read the patent and how we should evaluate what the IQ OS does. That's an issue that needs to be fleshed out with evidence discovery, expert testimony, and other court processes, not a motion with just the judge this early in the game. Our next questions come from LSZ and Colin Young, 
and they're all about what are the chances that settlement will happen pretty quickly after this motion is done and how early do settlements come in patent cases. Well, I couldn't find specific data that was really on target, but it is common legal knowledge that the vast majority of civil cases settle after discovery. That's when both sides know pretty much everything about the other side's arguments and the strength of their evidence. In patent lawsuits, there's an extra step with discovery called the claim construction phase. That's where the parties argue to the court how the patent should be interpreted. In this case, we've got a pretty big one with the phrase partial combustion that'll matter a lot in the claim construction step. Most patent lawsuits settle after the claim construction step since the parties will know the strength of each other's arguments, their evidence, and they'll know how the judge and jury will look at the patent. That doesn't mean it can't happen sooner though. In fact, if the motion to dismiss is denied and the case continues, there will be a great opportunity for mediation or other court-supported settlement negotiation to occur within the next few months. Doesn't mean it will happen, just that there's an opportunity. I can't give you any percent chance because that's just not how the justice system works, that's not how the parties think, and not how lawyers work together. You can't really use general statistics to tell how a totally unique lawsuit with two unique parties is going to end up. Our next question comes from Mind the Gap. How long will it take for the judge to come back with a verdict? I've seen this question hundreds of times on Twitter. Uh, it seems to be the, the biggest burning question. Well, it could be next week. It could be June. It could be May. It could be July. It could be next year. And anywhere in between. The judge doesn't really have a deadline. He's really busy. The court's way behind on everything because of COVID. And this is a major motion. Because if it's granted, it ends the case right here. It has huge financial impacts. That's going to push the judge to take more time to think about what the parties said in their documents. He could also decide to hold a hearing. In this court, the Northern District of Georgia Federal Court, there's no requirement to have a hearing on a motion unless the court orders one. So if the judge wants to hear more information about the case from the parties, he might ask for one. I have no odds to give on whether that would happen. So for us as spectators, it's really just going to be a matter of every day around 4 o'clock when the cl court closes, refreshing pacer, and seeing if an order has shown up yet. Following up on the last question and adding a little more to it, we've got Carlos R. Cortez and Tyler Pev asking that what are the different things that can happen if the motion to dismiss is ruled as granted? And what are the next steps if it isn't granted? So there's a few ways that this thing can go from here. First, the judge can deny the motion with no extra fanfare or information, just a line that says the motion is hereby denied. That case would continue, and then Philip Morris has 30 days to file their answer to the complaint, which is basically their list of defenses to the original lawsuit document that HCMC filed to kick off the case. There will also be a case management conference, you'll see a CMC order, between the two parties a few weeks after the ruling on the motion, where they would work with the court to schedule the next steps of the lawsuit, like discovery, that claim construction that I was telling you about, and the trial. Second way it can happen is if the judge grants the motion, but allows HCMC to amend their complaint and refile it. This is what we call dismissing the case without prejudice. HCMC could just update their complaint with more information about the definition of combustion and how it fits with the patent, which is what Philip Morris's main argument was in the motion. And then we'd wait for Philip Morris to respond to that new complaint. They could try to file a motion to dismiss on that one, and we'd repeat this process. Third, the judge could just grant the motion with prejudice. This is what Philip Morris asks for. With prejudice means game over. HCMC can't refile the suit and it's done here. HCMC could appeal the decision and they probably would given this huge factual dispute over the meaning of combustion, but we'd have to wait on whatever went on with that. Obviously, if you're an HCMC fan, you want the judge to deny the motion, but HCMC will likely get a new chance to update their complaint as long as the motion is granted without prejudice. Now from Robbie Maliki and Barhamaridos, sorry for butchering that name, uh, we've got questions about what are the possible outcomes and how they can reflect on the price and also what will happen if there's a settlement or if they win for the stock. Well, first of all, as I've said a million times now, I'm really bad at reading stock. I'm not a stock person. I'm a lawyer. Obviously, things that are bad for HCMC are bad for its stock, usually. So the judge granting the motion to dismiss would likely be bad for HCMC stock, as it would be a sign that they're losing the case. That's about all I could say about stock price. Again, that's not my expertise. You don't want to see how red my portfolio is right now. I'd like to work on a video, though, about this topic specifically, because there's a recent case where a stock tanked after a company won a $115 million verdict 
against a major retailer company. Stockholders in that case expected a verdict of over a billion dollars and were so disappointed in the low verdict that most of them sold their position immediately. I can't say that would happen here, but if you're all way too excited and thinking that it's going to be the biggest patent law settlement in history, well, you're probably going to be disappointed, and the stock price will probably reflect that. I urge you to be conservative on this, because it's all pure speculation. But I'm a lawyer, and that makes me a buzzkill. Next question from Donnie Wire, talking about injunctions. Why hasn't there been an injunction? Well, I made a video about this when I first started watching the case. Basically, HCMC didn't ask for one when they filed the lawsuit, which means they don't really want one. If they're looking to have an ongoing relationship with Philip Morris, then they want Philip Morris to license their patent or buy them out or some other financial re relationship, then they don't want to stop them from using the patent. An injunction is a court order that says, Philip Morris, you have to stop making the IQOS and you have to stop making money based on HCMC's patent. That's money that HCMC can get part of it if they won the case or if they made an agreement for licensing and royalties later. It just can't see it happening unless HCMC had another company interested in the patent rights. There needs to be a reason for Philip Morris to stop making money off the patent, and there just isn't one when HCMC wants a piece of that money. The last question here comes from Declan Donnelly. Hey, if we get to trial, how long is that process going to take? And how long does a case like this usually last? Well, here's the bad news of everything, right? Cases can take years to get to trial. The median is between two and three years. I found some data from 2017 that showed about two and a half years of a median trial uh, within patent law. But anything that has been waiting for a trial during COVID has basically added a free year to the wait because of the closures and the delays related to the pandemic. You might as well assume it's over three years from start to trial. But that's not all. After trial, there could be an appeal. And that can add several years to the process depending on what gets appealed and how far up the chain it goes. For example, let's say the HCMC wins a verdict at trial for a huge pile of money. Philip Morris could appeal that verdict to the next level of court, the Court of Appeals, and it might take two years to get a ruling there. If the appeals court tells the judge to retry the case, that's a few more years added on. In my opinion, the worst case scenario isn't losing the case at trial or before that. It's having five years of a trial process go, and then appeals, and then losing the second time it comes through. Low, low, low chances of that, but it's still a thing. Now one last thing I want to share with you before we go. My job isn't to pump a stock or be a cheerleader for any company. I'm here to present you all with an objective understanding of the law and the processes related to stock-connected litigation. Sometimes that means you're not going to like what I have to say, especially if it conflicts with what you want to happen. But if you're truly doing your due diligence and you're looking for good financial opportunities, then you should embrace the positive and negative information equally. It's important to know the risks associated with your stock choices. You've got money on the line. Don't just stick your head in the sand and pretend that there aren't any potential downsides. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. Come join our Discord server to ask more questions and chat with me in real time. I'll look to do more of these in the future. I say it every time and I mean it every time and I'll keep saying it. Do your own full due diligence. Make informed financial decisions. And I will see you all next time.